2019, which was the last time we were able to do this in person, had the great pleasure and honor of moderating a keynote uh, with Islanders co-owner John Ledecky. You had just broken ground on a new building, then known as what, the Belmont Park Arena. Right. Right? Um, is, my, is my mic on? Your mic is on. It is? It is. Hey, everybody. Hi. Thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. You know, I want to have a return on education right now, an experience for everybody. Everybody is going to get a free Islander hat. I got plenty of employees here. Let's go down the aisles and give out some free stuff. It's called swag in the business. Yeah. Now, this is a $30 retail value, and you're getting it for free. So by coming today, you've made $30, OK? Let's keep doing the math, because the next thing is I want to introduce my great team that's here tonight, today. First of all, a graduate of Columbia's program, the reason I keep coming back, because she is the best. She's a graduate of your program, ladies and gentlemen. We want more Columbia students at the New York Islanders. Nicole Hogan, stand up. Let's go, stand up and get, take a bow. We've got our Vice President of Marketing, Simone Perrin. Where are you, Simone? Please see these people for jobs. You need a return on education. A job is really important. Pick the hat, Simone is passing out the hats. We've got Mackenzie Morris, who's a manager. Mackenzie, where are you? Hopefully, you're giving out hats. Thank you very much. Anastasia Nelson, who's a manager. Where's Anastasia? There she is, right there, giving out hats. Carly Freed, where are you, Carly? I know your parents. Keep doing a good job. <laughs> Maddie Moore, Maddie Moore, who has to work for me. She deserves a raise. Garrett Jones, who's managing our inside ticket sales. And Leah LaPaglia, who's a senior manager of partnerships, is here too. Raise your hands. Everybody gets a hat. Different colors, different types, different prices. Ooh, nice. Hats in the corner, guys. Got hat needs in the corner. Let's toss them over there. We got hats. People want hats in the corner. OK, OK, settle down, settle down, settle down. Return on education number two. Everyone who goes to this conference is going to get an email afterwards with a link. Each one of you will have four free tickets to the Islanders games on either November 7th against the Calgary Flames, November 10th against the Arizona Coyotes, November 12th against Columbus, or the day before Thanksgiving, in case you're hanging out and have nowhere to go and need some turkey, against Edmonton. So those dates again, November 7th, which is a Monday, November 10th, Thursday. November 12th, a Saturday. November 23rd, a Wednesday. You have no excuse. I got four different days. I don't want to hear you have class or something else going on. Four tickets. You can bring three of your friends. You must be present to attend. And if you get there early enough, you will not only get some food, you will get a tour of the arena. Tour of our beautiful, brand new, $1.1 billion UBS arena. You do not have to be a student. You're here attending. You can come. You can bring your parents. You can bring your friends. You can bring your partners, whatever you want to do. Now, that's return on education. And that's what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to get what? Trial. We want you to become ambassadors for the Islanders. I met a Ranger fan in the bathroom. His damn brother works for us. <laughs> He's still a Ranger fan. I'm obviously failing. So I need your help, right? You're from all over the country. You can have a favorite team. Just make us your second favorite team, right? This is what we've got to do. This is the jobs you guys are looking to do, right? Is working, I think, many of you, working for a sports team. You start handing out hats at conferences. You end up running the show, right? That's the goal. Nicole's been promoted twice, three times. I don't know how many times. We keep trying to promote her. Now she's global. She's global. But she has done a great job for us. It all started at Columbia. and We love the Columbia program. Scott and his faculty have done a fabulous job. Congratulations for those of you who are at this program. If you're not at this program and you're thinking of applying, you should apply. It's the best use of your educational dollars. It's a great program. Consistently, we see that people coming out of this program are top notch. And we are open to hire people. We want to have nothing but A's, right? You want to have 10's in your organization. It's hard. We're a big organization. You guys and gals are 10's. Please think about applying to the New York Islanders. If you want to make an application, Jay Bieberman, raise your hand. Jay Bieberman, who's got cards, j.bieberman, B-E-B-E-R-M-A-N, at newyorkislanders.com. For those of you not here live, 
videotape, you can't get the tickets, but you can apply for a job, okay? So good luck to all of you, and thank you for having me. I appreciate it, goodbye. So every great co-owner has a great origin story. So the origin story of how you met your co-owner is an interesting one. And, I want, and one that kind of smacks of urban legend, right? So, and the story goes like this, and feel free to jump in if you want to. So, your family just moves from Brooklyn to Greenwich, Connecticut. You're out walking your Basset Hound one day. What was that Basset Hound's name? Fred. Fred. You're out walking Fred the Basset Hound, and a woman stops you. Now, this is some time ago. Today, we would call this stranger danger, right? Um, but back then, this woman stops you, starts talking to you, asks for your, uh, your name and phone number. You give it to her, and a few days later, you get a phone call. Yep. So basically, this woman who stopped me was president of the Greenwich Basset Hound Association. <laughs> and when you're coming from, actually, Bayside, Queens, where I grew up in the shadow of UBS Belmont Arena, uh, we moved uh, for some specific reasons for my dad who had a boss who lived in Greenwich. So I was a little bit out of sorts. And um, she said, oh, I know you must be new in town because I know every basset hound in town and I don't know you're a dog. And so she turned out to be my business partner's mother, Scott Malkin's mother, who invited me to their house, which looked like something out of Dallas. Um, they were living definitely on the other side of the tracks. And Scott and I became friends and college roommates and Scott went on to have a very, very successful career in real estate. And in fact, he has built uh, something called Value Retail over, all over the world. I don't know if any of you have ever been to England and visited Bicester Village, but that was his first project, those of you from England. And it's the highest square foot retail in the world. It's $6,000 a square foot. So you can imagine how uh, he has done in life. And we were running around the reservoir in Boston uh, in 2014, and he said to me, you know, we've never done anything together. Um, I missed your brief ownership of the Washington Capitals. I played hockey, as you did, as a kid. We should do something together, and I reflexively said, we should buy a hockey team. And so he stopped, he looked at me and said, okay. And that's how we started on our journey to uh, try to buy a hockey team. So my lesson, too, for you guys, apart from return on education, is Pick your roommates in life very carefully <laughs> for high school and college, and you'll do well. Yeah, and, and the Islanders weren't the first hockey team you pursued, right? No, and I, I was fortunate enough to be Ted Leonsis's partner uh, in the Washington Capitals. And that happened because I went out after I had sold my business. I decided to go and try to buy a baseball team. And I had a friendship with a guy named Jerry Reinsdorf who went to high school in Brooklyn with my mom, Erasmus Hall High School. And so he teed me up and said, we have a problem with an owner in Cincinnati named Marge Schott. She has made comments that Hitler was not all that bad as a leader. And that's kind of hard for all the owners we have and all of our Jewish fans to swallow. So can you go out and see her? But you must know that every time a wealthy person goes out to see her, she asks them to walk her dog Schotzi. And these people are very insulted by this, and they leave. So the day came when I went out there, and sure enough, it's about 95 degrees on the field, and there is Marge Schott, who also was a chain smoker, by the way, which enters into the story. She used to chain smoke for seven innings, uh, blowing smoke into the face of these applicants, and so they just left town. So I immediately said to her, Marge, Marge, is that Shotzi the dog? I love dogs, I love dogs. Shotzi then jumps up on me, I'm wearing a full suit with a tie, and slobbers all over my suit. And you can see that Marge thinks that uh, this is hilarious and that'll be it for me. I said, Marge, look at what Shotzi done. That's um, Marge, can I ask you a question? What? I don't have a dog. Can I walk your dog? Will you let me walk your dog? Please let me walk your dog. And she looks at me like, what are you, crazy? Of course I'm crazy. So, so I walked her dog. By the seventh inning, she's calling me her nephew. She wants to sell me the team. <laughs> done deal. Now, where was my mistake? Who knows the mistake, the classic mistake I made in convincing Marge shot to sell me the team and calling me a nephew. Does anybody know? Does anybody want to volunteer a guess? You'll get an extra couple of tickets. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <clears throat> she was not well liked in Cincinnati. So the fact that she was supporting this new owner of the team, everybody was suspicious. I must be like Marge Schott. 
And so I made the classic rookie mistake of not differentiating myself and not getting her approval, but not getting her incredible approval. So on the 30th day of the match, because the other limited partners could match, a guy named Carl Lindner matched my bid because he was a limited partner of the team. He ended up owning the team. I came back to Washington, and on my board was Ted Leonsis, who was running AOL. And he said, John, I really admire the fact you went out and tried to buy a team while you were running around trying to romance Mark Schott. I've convinced Abe Poland to sell me 100% of the Capitals and half the Wizards with an option to buy the other half. There's just one problem. We have to pay $200 million. Think about that now in the context of today. $200 million we were being laughed at buying 100% of the Capitals, half the Wizards, half the MCI Center, the arena, half the Ticketmaster franchise in Washington, and half the Mystics for $200 million. We were idiots. We would never make a return on our investment. P.S. It's now worth over what? $5 billion? $6 billion? whatever it's worth, right? And Ted sold off a piece to Lorraine Powell Jobs and her family at about a $5 billion valuation. So I've heard it every time somebody buys a sports team, oh my God, they're paying way too much. You've heard this, Scott, 100 times. They'll never make any money, and everybody so far has been making money. Yeah, it's worked out okay, right, for just about everybody. So wh why sports ownership for you, John? I mean, what was it, and, and your conversation with Scott, why were you interested in buying? I mean, how does it compare to some of the other investments that you've made? Yeah, I think that sports ownership is the best way to do non-political community service. Uh, whether you're working for a team or owning a team, you are representing a legacy. You're representing an asset that has decades, in some cases over a century, of affiliation with a community, right? It doesn't matter whether you're the CEO or the person who is taking the trash out for the CEO who's just come to this country. The combining feature is, did you see that game last night? What about the Giants? How the heck are they 5-1 and one this year? Isn't that amazing, right? People are beginning to wear their Giants and Jets gear in New York again, right? <laughs> They're happy to wear it. It's a unifying force. It's a way to talk to a stranger waiting for a subway on a bus, standing in line at Starbucks. It's a unifier. If you can unify a community through a sports team, you've got a great blessing. To be a steward of a professional sports team, amazing opportunity, right? Some wonderful guy gives $50 million towards a healthcare system. They put his name on the building, and for five minutes he might have some glory. I send our players to work in children's hospitals, and we get coverage after coverage after coverage, not about the team, but about the needs of kids with pediatric cancer. We have a megaphone. And I want to think about this, and I'm sure Scott has taught you this. Name me another business in the world where every day, for free, you're in every newspaper, every television station, on the bottom of the ESPN crawl, on digital, on social, have millions of followers on the various platforms, for free. IBM spends $150 million on the Masters. I get all that attention for our brand, admittedly, in a 13-team market. We get, thanks to Simone and Nicole and others, we get millions and millions of people watching what we're doing. We introduced something called Jack Pocket as the helmet sponsor. Jack Pocket is a lottery app. You can actually play the lottery now in New York and other states by going on your phone. No more bodega visits. You can actually do it on your phone, OK? I went into Central Park before we announced the deal. They said, prove to me that you can deliver us free media beyond what you'd pay for us. I went into Central Park. I held up the app. I had my video team video. I said, hi, John Ledecky, co-owner of the New York Islanders. I'm in Central Park about to buy 25,000 tickets for my season ticket members on the Jack Pocket app. OK? And Jay Bieberman is my head of communications, 860 million clicks on that story, which went national and viral because it was the day of the $1.2 billion drawing. We crashed their app with the attention and the amount of people who wanted to load the app, right? That's the power of sports on the other side, the income side that gives you the revenue to pay the players. So again, whether it's community service, volunteer work, whether it's commercialization, 
you have a brand that is worth so much. And I will assert to you, Scott, as much as I love the 160 owners of sports teams in the United States, none of us understand the power of that brand. They have been undermanaged brands for decades. And you, the first generation who grew up on a cell phone, can use a phone, ring circles around folks like me who are the owners, who understand digital and social media, you have the power to take those brands to where they should go. And if you come out of a sports management program like Columbia or you're thinking of going to one, you will come out not only ready with the phone, but educated to do something for the teams that you might want to work for or the leagues you want to work for or the causes you want to work for. Sports and causes do go hand in hand. Yeah, I, there's absolutely no question about that, and we talk a lot about that, obviously, in our courses. I saw some knowing nods from students who uh, heard something not delivered quite as well as you delivered it, but somewhat ham-handedly in my class uh, just this past week. Um, you have helmet sponsors. You mentioned Jack Pocket, uh, UBS uh, as well, uh, Divided Home and Away. Uh, you have a practice jersey deal with Northwell Health. Um, new in the NHL this year uh, is the ability to sign practice jersey, or I'm sorry, to sign right. game jersey uh, patch, patch deals. Um, you haven't done it yet. Um, we know you're in conversations, I'm assuming you're in conversations with, with a, a quite a few interested folks, but can you discuss the, the three completed deals first, beyond Jackpocket, uh, why those companies, right, beyond the obvious dollars, obviously, that goes into, into this, you know, which aren't always going to be the driving factor, what are you looking for out of a patch sponsor? Yeah, the, the partner has to be in line with the values and culture of the team, right? So if you make the mistake of just grabbing the dollars, you're going to end up regretting it a lot. So it might be really great to get paid X millions of dollars for a betting brand on your patch. Again, nothing wrong with that. Teams have done that. But that's saying something about your culture. And so the reason we don't have a patch deal is we want to wait until we find someone who's going to be aligned with our culture. And why is that important? You're asking your players to wear that name on their uniform, their uniform, where their name is on the back. How do you want them to feel when he or she puts on that uniform to play for a team and the value of that company's brand does not align with the values of the players or the fans or the community, right? Coal mining company may pay us a lot, but it may not align with the brand that your players who hate the notion of pollution, using a very simple example, might have, Scott. Yeah, and it's interesting, and using that example, there is a team whose owner made his money, essentially, uh, that afforded him the ability to buy the team by doing just that. So what are the values of the Islanders that you talk about? What is the culture that you want to align with? It's, for us, it's all about family. We talk about family from the beginning to the end. Right? Our team, if we look at our season ticket members, it's multi-generational. And every day, um, I'm one of the owners in the leagues who don't sit in the owner's box. I move around. I am the moving complaint box at UBS Arena. And I learn more about what we're doing wrong by moving around because the Islander fans have a reputation for speaking their mind. But the most important thing for me is the time when I have three or four generations of Islander fans at the same time coming up to me saying, Mr. Ledecky, can we take a picture with you? They're not taking a picture of me. I'm irrelevant. I represent to them the New York Islanders. And they want to have that Instagram memory and that Instagram moment. And so the values of family are the values that we preach not only in the locker room but also to our staff and also to the community at large. So it starts with that. It starts with making sure that during COVID, we're out there pulling our weight and recognizing the true heroes. And our whole campaign, when we had no fans in the seats, was to recognize the nurses, the EMS, the fire, the police, putting out ads, putting on television campaigns to say, thank you for putting yourself at risk. Thank you on behalf of something that, in retrospect, is a speck. The New York Islanders are a speck during COVID. But if we can distract people and give them some entertainment during that COVID period and make them feel better about themselves during that crisis that we've emerged from, then so be it. That's the role that a brand should play in a community. Yeah, and look, you are the face of ownership. You are the co-owner, but your, your, college, your high school buddy turned college roommate turned co-owner is based in London and runs a business there. So you are the face of ownership. Uh, and I shared this story uh, with you previously and with you, some of your team 
Um, but a true story. So my wife's best friend is a island, uh, and from college, right, um, is an Islander season ticket holder. And we have dinner a couple weeks ago, and she's like, you're not going to believe this, um, but John Ledecky knows my son. I'm like, okay, so you see, he's like, we see him at the games. I'm like, yeah, that he's, he's that, that's what he does. He's out there. She's like, no, no, no. He knows his name. He's a high school kid. And I show, and she sent me the picture. I just showed it to John before. He's like, oh, yeah, that's Zach. Right? Find me another owner who is like that. And why right? do I do that? Why do you do that? Because if you want to be sold out in an arena, and this is another return on education moment, it's one fan at a time. That fan has probably told that story 100 times. Hopefully that leads to 100 sales. Because guess what? Once you're sold out, there's no more tickets. What does everybody want in life? They want to go to something where they can't get in, right? When you, when you see Islander tickets, $3 online, do you get up and go, wow, $3, let me go, right? Those of us in the audience, some of us have some age in us. Remember Studio 54? You'd try to go, you'd stand there, you couldn't get in. It was the greatest moment in your life if the person moved the curtain and said, you can come into Studio 54. So when Ted and I took over the Capitals in 1999, we had 3,000 season ticket members. He sold out today. He's got a waiting list, right? Conversely, the Washington Commanders had a 50,000-person waiting list. No aspersions there. They have no waiting list now. So how you manage your brand, how you come across, how you deal with the community is so important. Because I'll give you one last point, which should open up for questions, which is fans, no BS. Fans have the greatest BS meter. And if you're not sincere, and if you're not out there, it's one thing to say I don't sit in the owner's box, but if you don't walk around every single game, it's BS, right? So be true to your values. Don't just talk the talk, which is easy for owners and others to do. You gotta walk the walk, and you gotta do the same thing in your careers, right? Commit to the organization that you're going to, sports, nonprofit, business, whatever. Commit to it. Make sure of a couple of things, ladies and gentlemen. It's the greatest, best advice I can give you. Make sure they're aligned with your values and your culture. Make sure they're aligned. Don't ever have to look down and say, I work for the XYZ, when you go see your friends or your family or your cousins or your in-laws, right? You want to be proud about what you do. Make sure you do your due diligence. No one is hiring you. You're hiring that company to work for. Make sure you understand that in a full employment economy, you have the choices, right? I'm here because I like Scott, but I'm here obviously recruiting the best and the brightest because I want my organization 25 years from now to be run by the folks in this audience. I want us to shine. I want us to be stars. If I get the chance through Scott to be here, I'll be here every year. I really appreciate you guys for listening to me, and I want to have any questions. I, yeah, can't, I don't have anything else to give away. No, 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 I, 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 no more swag, but we do have questions uh, for the audience. Uh, and by the way, not as we wait for the mics to be passed around, uh, to those who are, uh, there's a woman over here with her hand up. You rode the train to the game the uh, last week, right? I ride to the I ride the train a lot. They had me go with the mascot Sparky, who <laughs> had trouble with his head because his head's bigger than the train car. <laughs> but yeah, we had we we are encouraging people to take the train. So by the way, uh, Penn Station, 30 minutes from Penn Station, two stops. Okay, so no excuse there if you just come down, right? For those of you living on the east side, east side access starts in a month. You can go to Grand Central, 29 minutes. So there's no excuse not to come to UBS Arena. We have great Islander games, but we also have great concerts. We have Adam Sandler next Thursday. He's a riot. We have student-type ticketing pricing because I understood what it was like to be a student once. So go online, see the folks who are here today, come to a game, come to a concert, experience what a great third generation arena. We hadn't get a chance to talk about that or time to talk about it. But UBS is a special place and you will see when you come and take that tour. I, I encourage you to come to a game and take the tour pregame. You'll learn a lot for your uh, business degrees here, your, your management degrees. Yep. All right, in the back, Morgan. Hi, thank you. Hey, for Morgan. Hi, nice to meet you. Uh, thank you for this. Love your enthusiasm. So You've talked about how the Islanders are differentiating yourselves from other teams and innovating in different ways. Last year, you all signed an exclusive contract with Orange Comet. 
um, and to be the exclusive NFT partner. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that's helped innovate your team and like in I'm hockey? I'm going to ask Simone to answer that question. Where's Simone? Simone, hey, Simone Perrin, <laughs> our vice president of marketing, graduate of a West Coast institution. <laughs> Hi, everyone. So it's a great question. Um, there's obviously a lot of innovation happening in the space right now with NFTs. Uh, we're also in conversations with the league about how we're going to enter, enter into the world of the metaverse. So these are all things that we're thinking about as we think about how to get in touch with the next generation of fans and meet them in the places and the spaces where they're hanging out and spending their time. So as a league, as a team, we're always trying to innovate and think about where the next generation of fans are going to be. Uh, we had a very successful launch last year with Orange Comet. We did a program with them where we created these NFTs around the opening of UBS Arena. And I think at the time we had the highest revenue um, for any team at that point in time for NFT sales. So we were very excited about that. We are now looking into what we're going to roll out for this year for our 50th anniversary. So be on the lookout for that. And Simone, did you ever work in sports before you took a job with the New York Islanders? I didn't. I worked in management consulting and music, and then I met John and Scott Malkin and went to an Islanders game and fell in love with it. So I never thought I'd be where I am now, but I love it. And thank you, John. Thank you, Simone. Thanks for doing such a great job for All us. All right. Trish? Hi, Mr. Ledecky. Um, I'm Patricia Hardendorf, um, a fellow Long Islander and a lifetime uh, uh, multi-generation Islanders fan. And I and I will say, uh, Mr. Ledecky is is the most involved owner that we've ever had. I mean, I was I was at the game yesterday, and he was in my section. Um, so, <laughs> so he is. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. No Ledecky, for elevating our brand and helping bring um, the Islanders tradition into the new Thanks, arena. Trish. I just wanted to um, kind of get your sense of what the next maybe five, 10 years are for the Islanders and where you plan to see the team's positioning and maybe in the tri-state market or, or national-wide, yeah. what, what are the plans to develop um, the following and um, the business and continue the Islanders' legacy. Thanks for the question. Great question. Thank you for being a fan, multi-generational fan. You support my argument earlier. Um, look, 13 teams in the market, great legacy of brands, Yankees, Mets, Giants, Jets, Devils, Rangers, etc., Knicks, Nets. Wow, big, big market. Hockey has a lot for everyone, and hockey is a sport you have to see live, right? Hockey on TV is for those of you once you become fans, but you come to a game, you see the speed, you see that the fact that there's never, in hockey, there's no timeouts when they want to substitute a player, you do it on the fly. How many minutes is there actually in a football game? How many minutes of action is in a football game in the National Football League? Who knows the answer? <laughs> The answer is 13 minutes of actual action for the 60 minutes, three hours you sit in front of the television or go to the football game. 13 minutes where they're not huddling, they're not taking a timeout, they're not juicing up with Gatorade, right? 13 minutes. Hockey is 60 minutes. Hockey players lose 20 pounds of sweat per game, okay? If you have never been to a hockey game, do yourself a favor. You got free tickets. Come and see it. One quick story. We invited the New York Liberty basketball team to come, the WNBA team. They were in our box. Within three minutes of watching, they were all checking their phones. They were totally unengaged. I said, hello, teammates. I'm the owner of the team. John Ledecky, follow me. We put them in the front row. Within five minutes, they're back on their phones. They're calling their boyfriends, their parents. They're showing them videos of the players coming by, crashing into the boards. They have the time of their life. Next day, the phone rings. It's the general manager of the New York Liberty. Uh, I don't know how to express this to you. Thank you, Mr. Ledecky, but I have a request. What's that? They want to come again. <laughs> okay? So they got exposed to hockey. They're professional basketball players who are now wearing Islander uniforms, Islander hats, posting on social and digital, right? Because we gave them the exposure to the game in a way that they could relate to on the court, in essence, on the ice. So again, one fan at a time. What do I want to be in 10 years? I want to be sold out with a waiting list where people clamor to watch a championship hockey team. My goal in life for the fans is I have to deliver a fifth cup. 
I have to live long enough to deliver that fifth cup because every year, 32 owners in the NHL start 0-0, and every single one of them, despite the fact that the odds are 1-32, in 32, every single one of us thinks we're going to win the Stanley Cup that year. Right? Not a, bad, not a bad feeling to have, but only one can win. So I've got to, I've got to climb the odds there and, and try to win a fifth cup for your three-generation family and many other fans in the tri-state area. All right, we have time, I believe, for one more. Uh, Danny? Yeah? Maybe, maybe more? Okay, that's, everything's negotiable. <laughs> you got it. Uh, in the back, yes, you've been waiting, standing. No, you, yeah. Perfect. Wait for one sec for the mic, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Ledecky, for being here with us today. Um, What's your name, sir? My name is Ahmed Imam. And where are you from? Uh, so I'm actually from Phoenix, Arizona. Okay. And Coyote I'll land. <laughs> yeah. Coyotes play out there. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And uh, I went to the law school here at Columbia. Cool. Uh, we've had the pleasure of meeting at the at the last conference, so thank Good. you for coming back. You've grown um, up since then. Thank you so much. <laughs> somewhat. Did you somewhat. grow a beard since then? Uh, yeah. And, yeah, uh, I, I remember you clean shaven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now i got to find the fountain of youth. But uh, <laughs> anyways, um, so in your initial story, when you were speaking about the association with an owner who the fans probably didn't like, uh, would you call that a lesson in due diligence? And what other things would you say went into your overall due diligence in any approach that you made for a potential team that you were looking for? What factors do you think were most important to you, both from a granular standpoint and from a high-level standpoint? That's a great, great question. Uh, first cut is it is so hard to buy a sports team, increasingly hard today because so few are trading. Back in the 90s when I first started, there was a generational shift. The folks who had bought teams after World War II were retiring. Many of their kids were not interested or weren't involved or engaged. Now you have two factors at work. One. You're seeing the generation coming behind them now fighting with each other as brothers and sisters to see who runs the team, right? Denver got sold because the family couldn't figure out who should be running the team. When you see a team being sold now, it's usually because there's some family dynamic or some, in the case of Chelsea, political dynamic, right? Teams are not coming up that often. So due diligence is, of course, necessary to make sure you don't have issues inside your organization. But the hardest part is getting to the starting line, right? There are typically, I think they're saying in the Phoenix Sun situation, there are 18 qualified groups. So I'll turn that on its head, that question, and say, I'm the NBA. I'm Adam Silver. I can't afford to not do the due diligence on the owner because if the ownership group has people who are miscreants or have done something socially or otherwise inappropriate, I can't take the risk of making them the owners. So I think the burden has shifted from the person doing due diligence on am I making a good investment to the leagues thinking about who is going to represent my, my league as an owner. And that's why you're seeing diversity and inclusion become so important in ownership because ownership has to start reflecting society, right? Ownership has largely been white male. Ownership in the future has to reflect the fact that 45%, in the case of hockey, 45% of the fans are women. Only league-wide, 16% of the employees are women. Our organization is more than double that, um, and we're proud of that. But it, it has to be diverse, right? Again, ho hockey is 84% white. This is a report that just came out by the NHL. So we have to think about, as owners and as leagues and as citizens, we have to think about making the team ownership cadre, because now teams are so expensive, groups are being put together, that group should represent the diversity of our country. And I think that's going to be what leagues will promulgate in the future. They'll say, we should have a diverse ownership group so that we're aware of why it's so hard for a fan with a disability to get to a game, right? Why people who are ethnic minorities don't feel necessarily comfortable going to a hockey game. Why is that? We need to reflect that in who works for the team and who owns the team. That, to me, is the challenge for sports leagues in the 21st century that we have to solve. Let there be no doubt about that. John, we could do this all day. Well, thank you uh, for the time. We, we are out of time. Uh, I want to thank you so much for your generosity of time, uh, of gifts, of swag, of tickets, um, and uh, can't wait to do it again.